In this episode, I get to talk with Dr. Taryn Trott about the VTI or the Velocity Time Integral. And it's just an amazing conversation. I needed a review about it. I can't wait to see it with you. Also, check out soundandsurf.com. It's a course that Dr. Michael Macias and I are putting together in San Diego, California on March the 5th. Check out soundandsurf.com for more info. And now, on to the podcast. Welcome to the Ultrasound Podcast. I have with me a special guest. Taryn Trott is an emergency physician and a critical care doctor and an ultrasound doctor. And he's going to talk to us about a topic that sometimes I struggle with, I'll be honest, which is what to do with your hypotensive or poorly perfused patient and how to figure out what is the best strategy for managing that patient. Taryn, thank you so much for visiting me. I mean, I it, I mean, virtually, virtually. We, the last time we talked, we were like in the patio backyard right great. back there. Um, I, and yeah, I love the patio and it was so nice to actually like be able to talk with you in person, but you know, zoom is fine. It will do right. I mean, it's, it's it will, fine. It have to it's do fine. For now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you yeah, Jaylen, great. so much uh, for having me. Let's jump into it. Of course. Yeah, this is it's a good topic, and this lecture that I'm going to go through with you has had some iterations, and probably will in the future. Uh, and I think I think it's I think it's an important topic. And I, you know, there's a there's an article which maybe we can link at the bottom, and it's called "A Plea for Broader Use of the VTI." And I'm like, I resonate with that. So obviously, we'll begin there. We're going to be talking about stroke volume, we'll talk about cardiac stuff. Um, and a little bit, I always feel like when you talk about this, it's nice to have a little bit of a context, a little physiology, a little context. Agreed. Cool. Agreed. I can't um, wait. So yeah, for all the Adam Douglas fans out there, some uh, references in here, just in case. Jay, are you an Adam Douglas fan? Is that like an old president so, or something? I have no idea who that is. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, no. Uh, so long for thanks for all of your text. One of the original awkward sci-fi humor authors oh please. wait uh did you just quote hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy yes, that's when the dolphins yes, leave yeah. why didn't you just say hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy hitchhiker's I just guide know to the, the galaxy. author was big, big series it's good stuff that's a great okay. what is the so answer to everything like, yeah. wasn't it 33 i think it was 33 right i remember 42. reading the number 42 thank you oh my what God. was the question <laughs> right it doesn't, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter <laughs> life of the universe and stroke volume and so i think really important here is uh, why do I care so much? I'm always talking about this. I'm bringing it up over and over. And I think I, I'll make a convincing argument that stroke volume is really at the crux of how we approach shock and our differential. Like it's really the main dis decider in what's going on with our patient. So we're going to look at stroke volume kind of in two, two different realms. And we're going to break them up. We're going to look at preload responsiveness more on that in a second. And of course, differentiation of shock, which I think is super important, obviously. Let's treat the right type of shock. So first, a little on preload responsiveness. This is a little bit of like a, a holy grail in critical care and emergency medicine. We all want to know who's going to be a responder. And we can kind of see this in a mass macrovascular sense, right? Uh, and inevitably, it comes out to some permutation of, I gave fluids, and then what happened to the blood pressure? Like, did the blood, did they come mm -hmm. off pressors? Did they need another leader, right? And that's a very macro vascular kind of approach. And it could be blood pressure, it could be lactate. It could be heart rate. It could be mental status. Any one of these kind of big, big picture kind of um, concepts. And that's fine. You know, that's fine. And there's definitely a role for that. But I think we're going to take it a little bit more granular. <clears throat> and what we're looking at is the microvascular. And if we talk about shock, we're talking about inadequate oxygen delivery. And so when I think about really what I want to narrow down in preload responsiveness is, will this intervention increase my oxygen delivery? And is that like a, a bedside? I'm going to put my hand and be like, oh, oxygen delivery has gone up. I'm like, no, of course not. But it's the concept. It's the concept. We know that history and physical are poor. I bet half your podcast, Jay, somewhere says, ultrasound is here and history and physical is like down there somewhere, of course. Right. Oh yeah. I, I actually like struggle with this. Cause like when I'm teaching my residents, um, I'm like, uh, listen, brand new intern, like you still kind of need to know the physical examination, but also it's horrible and sucks. And like being able to like teach both and of those things, it's, it's tricky, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's, 
Yes, absolutely. Um, and yeah, we have lots of data on it too, you know, like lots of data showing mm-hmm. that it's, uh, it, you know, maybe in the astute clinician, I'm not sure I'm, my operative test, test characteristics are very good. Um, so when we talk about this, when we talk about stroke volume, preload responsiveness, we need to kind of differentiate in our mind. There's an intervention. We're always doing an intervention, a challenge, something dynamic. And then there's a method of measurement. So when we talk about methods of intervention, like one of the most common, of course, is going to be your fluid challenge. I gave a bolus, you know, one of my favorites, passive leg raise, and an important one is respirophasic variation. Uh, which I'll probably mispronounce a couple of times, but it's also one of my physiologically favorite as well. So let's talk about that. There's, of course, the blood pressure was low. I gave some fluids and did I fix things? Did I make things worse? I don't know. It sounds like a gamble. And if we look at the data, like 50% of the time, we're about wrong. So this one's going to end up pretty low. Now, here's the one I love is a passive leg raise. And it feels so like low five. It feels like, you know, who's that old school doctor doing passive leg raise? But this is honestly one of the most validated interventions. And we just don't do it that often. Well, I do it all the time. I love doing it. And I see you, ER. I, I, I'm an advocate for wider adoption. Nonetheless, when I suggest it on rounds, I always get like a couple bizarre looks or whatever, especially from the family. Like, did you see that doctor? What they're doing? <laughs> It is a little odd, right? I mean, if you think about it, if you don't know that it is an autologous fluid bolus, and if you happen to like overdo their system, you just set them up and it goes away. Like it makes sense physiologically, but you have to know that it makes sense physiologically. Yeah. I remember uh, a little bit of tangent, but I did a modified Valsalva on a a bartender in in town here, you know, names excluded, of course, and it worked. And uh, I would really? see that on occasion and be like, that was the weirdest thing you ever did, but it worked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you like seeing when you're out? Yeah, patient. Yeah, this is so long ago, but yeah, it was hilarious. Yeah. Nice. Um, and next we have respirophasic variation. And this is, we're usually applying this to mechanically ventilated patients. So when we have a mechanically ventilated breath, we have pressure pushed in, pushed in. And that mm-hmm. is going to reduce our venous return. We have impedance, pressure in the chest. The venous return is going to struggle a little bit more. We're going to have a decreased RV preload and then also increased RV afterload. And as this blood, as that transient, that ventilatory phase transient decrease in preload makes its way over to the left heart, then we have a transient decrease in cardiac output. And that's respirophasic variation. That's how it plays in with the, the thoracic cavity and your cardiac output. So these are all interventions. We can call the respirophasic variation an intervention that we're measuring. I just want to take a quick pause here and remind you about the Ultrasound to Leadership Academy. It is a year-long online virtual fellowship where we actually talk to you as the clinician. This is one-on-one hangouts and we're also available via email to walk you through taking your ultrasound to the next level. We offer image reviews so I can actually look at clips that you've obtained and give you tips on how to maximize those views and give you a full year-long curriculum. It's quite comprehensive in the best way possible. Um, and I came up with it, um, uh, not to toot my own horn or anything like that. Um, check it out, ultrasoundleadershipacademy.com. Now, when it comes to methods of measurement, there's so, 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 so many. Like now that we've done an intervention, what's the actual response? And as I mentioned, you could look at blood pressure, you could recheck a lactate. There's a, a lot of these long lists here, you know, are a bit more granular and we're going to see, of course, on here is aortic velocity time interval. There's a couple other mm-hmm. ones, um, you know, things like CVP is on there. Uh, we're yeah. not a big fan of the CVP. It's a static measurement. It's not good for uh, assessing preload or fluid responsiveness. You can get a wedge mm-hmm. pressure, left atrial pressure. Again, that's kind of makes sense. So if they have high left atrial pressures, maybe they don't need fluids. There's some validity in that. Is test characteristics aren't that good. Combine them. Again, really low sensitivity. So we need something better. And so that's Mm -hmm. where, of course, stroke volume comes into play. Stroke volume being a method to measure a response to an intervention. Is it your passive leg raise? Is it a bolus, et cetera? So this is a a curve. Um, I think you probably recognize, everyone recognizes our Frank Starling curve. Uh, We're going to have preload on the X-axis, stroke volume on the Y-axis. 
So the idea being that if we increase stretch on the LV, you know, we mm -hmm. increase preload that could be with fluids, we're going to increase our stroke volume. That's a nice assumption. We love it when that happens. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on where we're at on the curve, we see maybe they're going to be a responder. And I put 15% in here because that's what most literature is using as a cutoff. Um, mm -hmm. A little more on that in a, in a second. Now, this is a very LV-centric curve. This is like your muscular, buffed up LV. Your RV may have a different curve. That's a great topic, but not for today, I think. Yeah, when that's we, fair. For the next when, one. When we, look at, when we look at methods of measurement, I like this review. You'll find different reviews. You'll find different numbers. Pulse pressure variation, which we don't use very often in the ER, love it in the ICU, is probably one of the most accurate. Um, and then somewhere on here, we see stroke volume, which is a pretty good, accurate mm -hmm. measurement, stroke volume variation of preload responsiveness. So I have a question, sorry, if we could go back to that previous slide, yeah. like, I guess maybe I'm confused, right? Because pulse pressure, very, and, and this is not like, this is apart from the ultrasound measurement, right? But pulse pressure variation, that's the, like the, the map, basically, like on an art line on a patient who is mechanically ventilated, not over breathing, everything standardized yeah. with stroke volume variation. I guess I get confused as to like, why would that be a little bit less, I guess, accurate with regards to area under the curve when it's kind of measuring the same thing? Like, again, and one's a volume the, and one's a peak, but like, yeah. I, they should be similar. I don't know. And you think the stroke volume is actually, especially as, as we go through this, yeah. is that that's really what we want to know is what the stroke volume is doing. So you're probably seeing some margin of variation in the studies and how the studies I were okay. executed. And I think a lot of the pulse pressure variation, the early ones were at least um, proprietary uh studies oh of course so, you know, yeah i wonder yeah. about that too yeah, that'd be a deep dive in the literature uh but you're picking mm -hmm. up on a very good point where i i'm going to argue that stroke volumes like really at the crux of everything so right. don't, don't read don't read this slide too closely okay all right sorry about that i know you even try to skip over and i'm like hold up sorry <laughs> moving moving on <laughs> <laughs> so we see there's lots of different ways we can measure we can do preload right iron trophy mm -hmm. fluids maybe even diuresis, right? You could you could affect the preload mm -hmm. to a point where you get better contraction. So um, when I say preload responsiveness, that's the more uh, specific term. I may say fluid responsiveness, but really what I'm talking about is preload responsiveness. Some patients, I swear, every cirrhotic is preload responsive, but I don't want to keep giving them fluids and fluids. It goes nowhere and it just makes things right, worse. Right. So a subtle difference between those as I speak about them. So that's is that sorry that's is that topic. a galaxy uh, hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy quote because I love it I'm like gonna screenshot it isn't it like uh, I feel like it defines my clinical career uh, <laughs> yeah. um, yes it is absolutely uh, <laughs> so then we have differentiation so we're talking about preload responsiveness we talked about that now we're talking about differentiation shock and if you Google this and remember what we all learn in medical school or, or training there's four types of shock which I think is a good training paradigm maybe probably but we just know there's so much more complicated than this right we know there's more than just our catecholamines there's our angiotensin there's our ras there's our, there are, there's our 80 um adh and vasopressin there's so many different things that even affect just vascular tone endogenous prostaglandins all this stuff so this like is it's kind of in my opinion a little bit of an oversimplification we're going to work with it now and inevitably, if you Google this, you pull up something that says heart rate goes up, stroke volume goes down, pulmonary capillary pressure goes up, you know, so all the permutations of this. So a lot of these things ultimately are looking at things like stroke volume, um, systemic vascular resistance, CVP, and cardiac output. Cardiac output, for the sake of this, and I'll probably re repeat it in a second, cardiac output is our stroke volume times heart rate, cardiac output, stroke volume. We're assuming they're the same or linearly correlated as long as their heart rate's not changing, which is something to be cognizant of. But let's put this a little bit in context. Let's not divulge too much. A little bit in context. We have a 66-year-old who transfers into the ED, has a history of three-vessel cabbage, has a PCI, is on two blood thinners, dual antiplatelet thinner, 
they already popped positive cultures from the transfer hospital. It's only been six hours. They got gram negative bacteremia. That must be a pretty bad infection if they already grew out. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah exactly. And this person ha- hasn't been eating for three days. You know, maybe mm. they're like found down in their own co- on right. their own couch, right? So, right. Um, and of course, my favorite blood pressure. Uh, that's specific. 60, very, that is my favorite blood pressure. 67 over 35. And already, just from this vignette, could be in shock from so many different things, mm-hmm. right? We have all, all sorts of etiologies here. So we take that vignette and we ask ourselves, well, what do we think if the stroke volume is high? You know, what do we think if the stroke volume is normal or even low? Like, mm-hmm. we know there's a component of sepsis. The patient has gram negative bacteremia. So what does right. it mean if the stroke volume is high? Maybe it's a pure sepsis. If the stroke volume is low, that makes me think there's some kind of mixed shock picture, right? right? Because it should be mm-hmm. high, but now it's low. So is there a cardiogenic component? Is there a hemorrhagic component? Is there just a hypovolemic from an anorexia component? And so you can see how the same vignette could go a lot of different directions with this one piece of information. So... That's where stroke volume, I think, is essential. My opinion is essential to the differentiation of shock and, of course, the subsequent management. All right. Um, So, you know, at some point, you know, like, I thought you were going to talk about ultrasound. (laughs) That's the uh, preamble. I was so excited to talk to Taryn and so excited to edit the video that I kind of decided to put it into two parts. So I hope you enjoyed part one of that amazing VTI lecture that we spoke about. This was just the background. So if you want to know a little bit more about the ultrasound part of it, stay tuned for part two of my most recent interview with Dr. Taryn Trott. Don't forget, we have a course coming up March the 5th. It's just in a few days here in San Diego where we're going to spend time doing hands-on, a little bit of didactics, and some hanging out with regards to point-of-care ultrasound for really any provider who sees patients. Check out the Ultrasound Leadership Academy at ultrasoundleadershipacademy.com, our courses on the coreultrasound.com website, and our free content on the YouTubes. Hope to hear from you soon, and happy scanning.